Hi everyone, welcome to lecture 10. Today we're going to be talking about social control and self-control theories of crime. So in the last class, the control theories that we talked about were describing neighborhood level influences. And today we're going to bring it down to the individual level and talk about how individual people who experience different levels of control in their lives might be more or less likely to commit crime. I want to remind you all that on Wednesday of this week, instead of having class as usual, we are going to have a library session where you're going to go through an instructional on how to conduct the research that you need to do for your paper in this class. Now, the reason that I'm doing this is usually what people are do people are good at in terms of this paper is people tend to be very good at describing the character from the wire and describing a theory. What you usually struggle with, in my experience, is finding really relevant and useful empirical journal articles and applying them in your paper. So that's what this library session is going to be about. How to find empirical scientific journal articles that are written about the criminological theory that you've picked. So you all have picked a character, you've picked a theory of crime to look at. What you're going to do in this session is learn how to find research about that theory of crime. So you're going to go to Cook Library, uh, room 526. It's on the fifth floor, and a librarian by the name of Sarah Nixon is going to be running the session. Now she's done this before with this class about this paper topic, so she's v going to be very helpful and actually has a lot of knowledge about some of the good articles and ways to find research uh, about some of these theories. This is mandatory. This is not an optional thing for you. You have to go to this library session and do this. And I think that you will find it to be valuable because it will get you jump started on finding research for your paper. So let me know if you have any questions, but otherwise please enjoy if you can and go to the session on the 7th. Alright, so today we're going to talk about kind of the rest of the large field in criminology that we call control theories. So in the last class we talked about social disorganization and a lot of people also refer to that area, to the area of social disorganization as neighborhood control theories. That's because social disorganization is a control based theory of crime. It believes that there are neighborhood level influences which control residents which restrain them from committing crime. So that's why we call it sometimes a neighborhood control theory. Today we're going to talk about theories at the individual level. Control theories talking about how different influences in society and in our personal relationships might constrain and conform us. So basically in all control theories, what control theories do is they are interested in looking at how society maintains conformity and how failure to obtain conformity leads to deviance. So the interesting questions here aren't necessarily what causes someone to commit, to commit crime, but control theorists really approach this perspective from what controls and constrains so many people in society to not commit crime. So in other words, the two kind of big questions the control theorists in this area ask are, what protects some people from committing crime and what frees others? to commit crime. And the idea that in the absence of control you're going to commit crime is a fairly unique assumption in control theories that really sets it apart from some of the other theories that we'll learn about in this class. And I think what you'll see today is the control theories that we're going to talk about have elements that sound a little bit like what you learned about last time in social disorganization. That's a good thing because these are these are control theories just like that one is. The only difference being in social disorganization, we learned about neighborhood level influences, things like poverty, population mobility. Today, we're going to talk about things like how control in your family might control you, how control from your parents, how your bond to school. So it's, it's control at the individual level, looking at individual differences between people.
I've described throughout this class that each time we learn about a new theory of crime, there's often going to be a different kind of assumption that the, that, that theory makes about human nature. Each of the theories that we learn about in this class approaches human nature, approaches our natural drives and forces and motivations from a slightly different perspective. And control theory takes an assumption about human nature that, again, is, is going to be very similar to the ideas coming from things like social disorganization theory. The assumption basically being in control theory that humans, if left to our own devices, would naturally commit crime. If, if we weren't controlled by societal forces, family influences and pressures, any of the different informal or for formal types of control we experience in our life, we naturally would commit crimes because crimes are the easiest way to get what we want. As, as humans, according to control theory, we are self-seeking, self-serving, hedonistic creatures. So the assumption here is that in the absence of things like societal controls, laws, norms, you're going to do whatever it is that you need to do to get what you want. And oftentimes that would usually mean committing crime. So in control theory, the interest here is what are the controlling forces that keep most people conforming to norms. Most people don't commit a lot of crime on a daily basis, at least not a lot of serious crime. And the interest here is what keeps so many people from committing crime, from conforming to norms, and what causes and allows other people to be free of those norms and commit crime. So in control theories they're really asking two fairly similar questions what causes people to conform and what frees people to commit crime. Think about how different this is from the ideas in strain and anime theory that we already talked about in this class. In those theories, people, if left to their own devices, are social compliant beings. It takes strain and pressure to push someone into crime in strain, strain and anime theory. That's a completely different take on human nature from the ideas in control theory. In strain and anime theory, the assumption is that humans are naturally compliant and social. In control theory, the assumption is that humans are naturally self-serving. Very different ideas. Also think about how different it is from the ideas in learning theory. In learning theory, the assumption is that humans are essentially born as blank slates, and we have to learn everything that we do, including the norms that we believe in. Well, contrast that with the ideas in control theory. Control theorists believe that humans are not born with a blank slate. We're born kind of pre-programmed to do whatever we need to do to survive, to get ahead, to get what we want. Very different ideas and assumptions. And finally, if you compare it with the ideas in social disorganization theory, you should see that con this individual level control theories are really not that different. In social disorganization theory, at the neighborhood level, the idea was that if communities are in absence of control, there will be high crime in them. This is a very similar idea, it's just that it's broken down to the individual. In individual people's circumstances, if they don't experience controlling forces, they individually are going to commit crime. So again, similar ideas, but at the individual level now. Control theory has a very long history in the development of criminology, and most people trace, trace it back to some of its earliest origins in the work done by several scholars at the University of Chicago in the early 20th century. One of the most prominent and most, um, most cited works in terms of starting this movement was a book written in 1920 by a sociologist at the University of Chicago called Thomas Zanecki. And he wrote a book called The Polish Peasant, which, you know, at the time, his main interest was describing the lives of children of poor Polish immigrants coming into the country. So he was primarily using narratives, using accounts of their lives, of children in Chicago, in, in low-income areas of Chicago, poor, poor Polish immigrants, describing what it was like to make that transition from Poland to the United States. And what he observed, kind of the big message that got 
interpreted and kind of set off the, the movement at the time was the fact that these children described how coming to America really made them feel as though they weren't experiencing any kind of controlling forces. So at the time, when you, you think about what these children were experiencing, they were coming into a new country, their parents were being forced, both parents most of the time, were being forced to go out all day, work all day, not really have a whole lot of control over their children. There weren't really good schools around. There wasn't a lot of kind of normal activities for them to become invested in. And basically what, what he described in this book was the fact that in the absence of any kind of controls, these immigrant children were becoming what he called demoralized and delinquent. And, you know, this really set off a movement of interest in understanding what happens to children, to adolescents, who don't experience any of the normal controlling forces in their lives. People started to explain kind of delinquent problem behavior as being due to this absence of control. And he was kind of the first person to write about this in any kind of a formal way. Again, this was a book. This was a narrative account of a specific, specific group of people. So not necessarily what you would call a theory yet, but definitely had the underpinnings for ideas that would get used in the next few century, uh, in the next few decades. So the early social control theorists are were researchers, all kind of coming out of the University of Chicago, influencing each other. If you think about it, this is also the place where social disorganization as a theory was born. So it makes sense that theorists were all kind of coming out of this school and reading and influencing each other and developing this new line of theory. And the first era where people people started to take interest and do some do some writing and some research in this area is what we call early social control the era the, the first era of social control research and most people cage that within the 1950s and 1960s now i've told you before that not every theorist not every theory of crime necessarily is, is general, has a general offering of an explanation for criminal behavior. Well, that's never more true than it was with these early social control theorists because the only group that they were really interested in looking at at the time was juvenile delinquency. So they were interested in trying to explain why young boys get into trouble and start committing crime. And when you put it into context and look at some of the other research that was being done at the time, the idea of gang development, youths forming young urban gangs, was something that was a very new and thought of to be a very huge problem back in the 1950s and 1960s. So it makes sense that researchers at the time really wanted to develop theories to try to explain why boys tend to form into these groups and get into trouble at such young ages. And because these are control theorists, they were approaching this from an idea that what we should be interested in is what kind of control these boys are experiencing from their parents, or lack thereof. So what is it about parenting strategies and parenting styles that causes boys to not experience c control? Now, there are three main authors that we're going to focus on here, and I don't want you to worry too much about the differences between them, because all three of these authors really wrote influencing each other, writing about very similar topics. So I kind of grouped them all into uh, a group of authors all talking about this, this early social control theory. And I think what you'll see is each of them has a slightly different take on the ideas, but all contributing to developing this individual level social control theory. And put together, the three of them are going to have a very obvious influence on what became a much more formalized theory in the 1970s. But first, let's talk about these three authors. So we have Albert Rice, Jackson Toby, and Walter Reckless, all three writing papers and doing some early research in early social control theory. <laughs> 